All right. Welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice question series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. A speech therapist reaches out to you, a behavior analyst, and requests information regarding one of your clients. Your client is a five-year-old boy with autism who uses a device to communicate. This is the first time you've spoken to the speech therapist and you weren't aware that your client receives speech therapy, but you share any information that the therapist requested. Have you done anything wrong? Now, we have an ethics question here, and, your, and the question is asking about your behavior. Have you been ethical? Well, what happened was a speech therapist contacted you and wanted information. The most important thing to remember with information is privacy. We have to consider HIPAA, and then we have to consider our ethical code. Above all else, you have to maintain privacy for your clients. So one of the first things you should do in practice when you get a new client is figure out what kind of consent you need and permission you need to obtain whatever records you require. Because remember, analyzing records and collecting records, historical records, therapy records, school records, whatever it is, is very important to our initial assessments. So the first thing you want to do is make sure you have that consent. In this case, though, the speech therapist reached out to you. You've never spoken to them, and you weren't even aware they had speech therapy, but you shared all the information regardless. Now, not only do you need consent and permission, but anyone you're going to share private information with, you need to be sure they also have permission. So have you done anything wrong by just telling this therapist whatever they wanted to know? A, no, behavior analysts should collaborate with other team members. Now, that is true. Collaboration is key. You have to collaborate with other team members. However, before you can give away all the private information of a five-year-old client, you need to be sure who's ever reaching out to you is actually allowed and has permission to that information, which you failed to do in this case. B, yes, you do not know if this therapist had a right to that information. Yes, you're not sure if that therapist even has a right to that information. And you might say, well, they're also a professional and they work with the kid, which is true. But we have these things in place to protect the client, which above all else is our most important and number one priority. Do no harm. C, no, as a trained speech therapist, that person has a right to client information. Not necessarily. You don't know the situation. You have to check with the primary stakeholder or the primary guardian of this boy. D, yes, you should not share information over the phone. Depending on the information, depending on the situation, maybe, that's not a hard and fast rule. You can, you can obviously speak over the phone about clients. The biggest issue here is you do not know if the therapist had a right to that information. Now, you might think, well, that's being very picky, right? You, I mean, this therapist already works with this client. While true, again, privacy is there to protect our clients, especially young clients like a five-year-old who can't necessarily protect themselves. Behavior analyst is working with a 13-year-old client who runs away from the table when presented with the task demand in order to escape the demand. Following a reinforcer assessment, the analyst is now going to begin intervention. Assuming all interventions below would work to reduce the running away behavior, which intervention should the analyst prioritize? All right, we have an inter in interesting question here, right? We, we are looking for the intervention we want to prioritize. What's interesting, though, is all the interventions we assume are going to reduce the running away behavior. Why can we assume that? Because the question tells us that. It says all interventions below would work. So we have four interventions. How are we going to choose which one to prioritize? Well, in this case, let's start thinking about what we are trying to accomplish when we choose interventions. First off, ethics, right? We always want to do no harm. Second, if we're going to replace a behavior, we need to teach something new. Remember, a fair pair rule, right? You decrease a behavior, you need to replace it with something else. And it needs to be functionally equivalent. In this case, this client runs away in order to escape. So the function is escape. If we're going to reduce running away, we're also reducing access to escape for this client. 
So we need to teach them something else to access escape or they're going to start running away again. So let's look at our different interventions. A, a fixed ratio schedule for task completion in the absence of running away. Well, this is going to teach or reinforce task completion, but are we necessarily teaching an alternative to escape? Well, no, the client is still has no behavior that is going to allow them escape. They might start completing the task more, but the function here is escape. So A isn't bad by any means, but is there something better? B, a non-contingent reinforcement plan that provides a client a break every five minutes. Now, non-contingent reinforcement might reduce the motivation for escape, but again, we're not teaching anything new. So although that intervention we're assuming would work, is there something better? C, a DRA procedure which teaches the client to communicate when they would like to be done with the task. All right, so here we're going to, instead of having them run away, we're now going to communicate their needs. C is actually teaching that new functionally equivalent behavior. So while A and B could be effective, we're missing that piece where we're having this replacement behavior because the client still needs to escape at some point under their own power. And with C, we're giving them that power through communication. So C is better than A and B. And then D, a response cost procedure that occurs when the client runs away. What's the main thing wrong with D compared to A, B, and C? Well, D, we're using a punishment procedure. And we typically don't want to start with punishment except under very rare circumstances. So D is not as good as A, B, or C, especially if all of them will be effective. So the intervention we're going to prioritize, assuming they're all effective, is going to be C, a DR, or DRA procedure that not only reduces the behavior, but it also teaches a functionally equivalent replacement. A behavior analyst gives a stakeholder homework. The behavior analyst tells the stakeholder they need to measure how long it takes for the client to finish lunch and dinner. The analyst tells them lunch or dinner is over when the client has eaten what is on their plate. A week later, the stakeholder says, I did not use an actual timer, but I would say the client ate faster than usual. However, data collected by the analyst does not indicate the same result. The stakeholder has created what? Whenever you put stakeholders in charge of data collection, you want to be very, very precise and almost over the top in your ongoing assessment of that data collection. You want to make sure it's good data. In this case, the stakeholder was to measure how long it takes the client to finish lunch and dinner. So looking like some sort of duration measurement and then duration or duration is over or dinner is over when the plate is clear. Stakeholder says, I didn't use an actual timer, but I would say the client ate faster than usual. What's the issue there? Well, imagine you took duration data, but didn't use a timer. You just in your head had an estimate or a ballpark of the length of time. That's going to be a problem, right? Because maybe you are accurate. Let's just assume you're accurate. You're not going to be as accurate as an actual timer. So that's an issue, especially knowing the data collected by the analyst didn't indicate the same result. So what has the stakeholder created? Well, the stakeholder created an artifact. It's it's a, a, a variable or a piece of data that appears based on how the, the behavior was measured, which is incorrect. And because the stakeholder didn't use an actual timer, they measured it however they measured it, they've produced this artifact because of the way they measured the behavior. It isn't a confound because a confound is a variable that's affected the dependent variable. And we're talking measurement here. They didn't create an independent variable. They didn't introduce anything new. There's no new intervention being introduced, anything like that. And it's not an issue with frequency recording because they're measuring how long it takes the client to do something. So the stakeholder, the way they measured the behavior produces inaccurate result. And so they've created this artifact due to how they measured the eating behavior. A middle school teacher implements a level token system to use during math, which is typically the most challenging part of the day for the students. The students can earn tokens for answering questions, completing tasks, and being attentive. Eventually, the middle school teacher will need to reevaluate her system. Which of the following options will be most important to consider during the evaluation? The key here is most important. So some of these 
might be relevant. It might be important. We're looking for the one that's the most important. And so when you have questions like this with most or not, you want to be very, very specific because some of these answer choices could appear correct, but are they the best answer? And we're always looking for the best answer. So we want to, or the teacher wants to reevaluate her token system. So what can she possibly do during that evaluation? A, consider if all students can earn the same rewards to make sure the system is fair. A is not ensuring fairness in the system. A fair token economy is when kids or learners or clients have access to things they want to buy. If you have 30 students and they all earn the same rewards, what if half the students don't want the rewards? That isn't fair. That's unfair. So picking the same rewards is not making the system more fair. B, consider if the, war, the rewards are still motivating to the students. Absolutely. That's got to be number one because no matter how good your token system is, no matter how good your reinforcement system is, if the students don't want the rewards, it's useless. It makes no difference. So number one is they have to want to work to exchange those rewards or exchange for those rewards. C, consider the number of tokens required for rewards. This is important because as the level system grows, as the token system grows, your economy is going to change and the value is going to change. But B is still more important. Why? Because the number of tokens is irrelevant if the students don't want to use the tokens. That's got to be number one. D, consider a fixed interval schedule for providing tokens. Reinforcement schedule, important, especially when you start to fade things out. But number one in the token system, the token economy, the rewards have to be motivating above all else. If the rewards aren't motivating, the kids aren't going to want to earn the rewards. And if they don't want to earn the backup rewards, they aren't going to want to earn the tokens. The most important thing to consider during the evaluation are the rewards still motivating to her students? A paired stimulus preference assessment and a multiple stimulus preference assessment without replacement are useful for creating hierarchies. What disadvantage is there to using MSWO compared to the paired stimulus? I get this question a lot. What's the best way to identify a hierarchy? And I always say it's the paired stimulus or the forced choice. If you look in Cooper, there's a reason why. Because the paired stimulus and the MSWO, the stimulus without replacement, very similar. Except the multiple stimulus without replacement has one disadvantage that the paired stimulus does not. Which is why I say the paired stimulus is better at establishing the hierarchy. Both are good. Paired stimulus is better. So what is that disadvantage? A, the MSWO is typically limited to only larger items. It's actually the opposite. The multiple stimulus without replacement is typically limited to smaller tabletop items. That's how it's typically run, at a table with items in front of the learner. The pair stimulus allows for a lot more variety in items and flexibility in items. So B is the answer. What about C and D? We always read all of our answer choices. C, the multiple stimulus without replacement requires at least five items. That is untrue. D, the multiple stimulus without replacement does not have any disadvantages compared to the paired stimulus. Again, untrue. The answer here is B. This is more of a education question because this question comes up all the time. Which one is better? They're both useful as if with, with anything else. It's dependent on, on the situation, but all things equal, the multiple stimulus without replacement has one disadvantage, the paired stimulus does not. And that is the multiple stimulus without replacement is typically limited to smaller tabletop items. A university research team puts together a telehealth intervention with the goal of training parents on functional communication. Prior to starting, the parent and the child both have to agree to participate in the intervention. One child who is eight years old says, I do not want to do this and refuses to answer any questions and eventually starts to cry. What has the child withheld? When we are doing research and Whenever you're working with humans in general, right, you need consent and you also need assent. And we always talk about consent, much less common to talk about assent. And with our job and your job as a BCBA, I would say many, if not most of you will be working with kids under 18. And so when you're under 18, you don't have necessarily the power to give informed consent or consent yet. So 
Those people who can't give consent give assent. So in this case, when this eight-year-old says, I don't want to do this, refuses to answer any questions, and starts to cry, that child has withheld a assent. That is the difference between assent and consent. This is important to know for research questions. This typically comes up in research. If you're doing a research project with humans under 18 or who can't provide consent, you have to have a procedure in place that says, even though they can't give consent, they're still agreeing to participate in my research. In this case, the eight-year-old, through their actions and their words, they don't, they're indicating they don't want to participate. And so the child, this eight-year-old, is withholding what we call assent. Thank you for watching. Check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials. Make sure you like and subscribe. Be sure to let us know when you pass so we can include you in the Sunday shout-out. Work hard. Study hard. See you soon.